So, you know, we were talking about overflowing love last week. I'm going to have to take these off because of where I'm at. And I saw something while we were, while we were in worship. You know, you, it's natural to expect, expect things to be like they were last time sometimes. And he was showing me this morning how if you're going to be led by the Spirit, then you have to let the Holy Spirit define the parameters of what you're doing. You know, like he can push you to do places to do uncomfortable things, to move in ways you're, un, you're not used to moving. But the next time you come around in a corporate gathering like this, it may com- be completely opposite that he wants to give a gift of his presence in a way that you need this morning. And what he showed me during worship was, I I leaned over to Ron, I told him, because when I grew up, our situation, I guess is the way to put it, was that my great-grandfather had given all of his sons land, and his sons gave their kids land. So the whole family was right around each other, almost you could see each other's houses. And so my house that I grew up in, I could see my grandparents' house. Like we were literally in what used to be their horse pasture. And I remember when I was little, my mom would walk out of the house with me and my grandma would walk out of their house and it was a ways away, it wasn't close. It was like 300 yards, 400 yards, something like that. But they had mowed a path in between the houses and the grass was taller than I was, but my grandma would stand out there and my mom would lead me out there and then my mom would let me go and I would run to my grandma. And while we were in worship today, the Lord said, what did you have to do to earn the reception that you got from them? And I said, nothing. They were overjoyed to see me coming. And he said, that's how I feel about you. You don't, you don't have to strive to get me to be with you. There's sometimes I'll ask you to do things for your own good, to, to bring you to new places of freedom, to teach you new ways of being. But you're not earning my presence That's just obedience to my word. What I wanted to show you this morning was how much I love you. And I was just ready to receive that word. I don't know about you, but I I know, I know when it's the Lord and it's the Lord. I know how I'm supposed to be delivering this word to you this morning. Notice, it wouldn't be right for me to yell at you this morning, for me to try to get a point across with a bunch of this stuff. I don't need to. He's here, and what he's saying is simple. But as he's teaching us to overflow in our love, We need to pay attention because, see, he says it here in Philippians 1.9. It says, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And I see this in a, a very specific way for this morning's message because I see that the knowledge that we need is, what are you doing, Jesus? What is it, what do you want to do today? What pleases you today? What is your word for us today? There may be somebody in here, and if it was one person, it would be enough for God to take this entire service and turn the volume down on it so that he could tell them, no, no, it's okay. I'm so glad that you're here. 
I love that you came to my house today. And we need to be understanding that that, that real knowledge is Him. It's, it's the knowing Him well enough to know what is Him and what isn't Him and to discern your circumstances, to discern the situations that you walk into. Some things may need a strong word with a, you may need to have the backbone of the Lord in these moments where you need to stand firm and speak the word in all boldness. And sometimes a gentle word turns away wrath. And you need to be able to know the difference. And you are a people that will know the difference. Because I see where he's taking us. I see this education that he's giving us. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to be entrusted with. Because you're, you're representing the very nature of God. That's why you have to discern because see there are some words I was thinking about this. Actually, let me, let me get a little deeper and then I'll tell you that part. We gain this knowledge of him as we walk in relationship with him. What have we been talking about for a couple of years now, but intimacy and being in right standing with him and knowing him and making sure that we don't have anything that's restricting the flow of his presence in our life so that we can be sensitive to what he desires to do in the moment, how he wants to move, what he wants to say. To be able to discern the difference between what is true and what isn't true, you're gonna need that a lot today because I'll tell you, I've, I don't know, I, I bet if we compared notes, Ron, you would agree that there's more straight out heresy than I think I've ever seen. People just saying things that just have no basis in reality or the Word. And they're putting it out there as Christian. And you need to be able to know that's not how God is. That's not what God said. Simple though, when you're in that place, I, I was talking to Mary yesterday about this and it was that place of discernment for Jesus was, it, the way that it defined it was that he knew the fear of the Lord like you could smell. Is there any question when you smell something you wish you didn't smell? No. You know immediately, nope, doesn't pass the smell check. No, I don't want to walk in there. What is that? We've all been there, right? Imagine if discernment is that simple for you by the Spirit where you just know, no, that doesn't smell right. That's not right. That's not what he says. That's not who he is. What about when somebody tells you something about you? I think you need to have that same level of discernment to know what is and isn't, to know what to agree with and what not to agree with. Because see, that place of offense and that place of unforgiveness that Pastor Ron was talking about is very important. Most of those things happen because a word came to you that wasn't directed from the Lord or it wasn't given in the spirit that it was supposed to be given in. Something happened, somebody said something, somebody did something. Now, if you know the truth, No. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. That's not true. That's not me. That's not you. Better, better to know that's not you that's saying that to me. And I'll tell you the truth. No matter what is said, Lord, if there be an evil way in me, if there be something in my heart that doesn't need to be there, reveal it to me, God. I don't want to walk in this place. I don't want to walk in arrogance where I think that I'm fine. So I want to know, God, that we're good. But I'm not going to receive just every word because somebody says it. 
because you couldn't, I don't think the days in which we live, you could be destroyed in a day by the things that people say about what you believe, about who you are. No, to know the truth and to be able to discern it when you hear it, what is important and what doesn't matter. This is life for us. It's just the truth. We have to know. And so what does it look like though? I, I was, the Lord led me to something I didn't expect when I was asking him this. And it, he was showing me that this knowledge and discernment in abounding love is to know who you are in him. And if you notice, I've been teaching you about your calling and about your ministry and every believer is a minister, not to say that everyone will be behind a pulpit, but that everyone will need to share what they have been given by God with the world that they're called to. You have a calling. You're, if you wondered about your significance in life, let me tell you that you are the only one in your field of ministry. Like, I don't even know where your field is. You have to be faithful in your field of ministry. How he uses you and how you are called to pray matters to the people around you, whether you see it or not. If you walk into work every day and you're praying in the Spirit and blessing that place with the Word of God, and you're, you're just speaking the truth of God over your atmosphere, your place of being every day, His presence will change that place because there's power in His Word. And there's power in your obedience to His Word. But if we try to hide, we're robbing people of the treasure that he's given us to give away. See, the, the wonderful thing about overflow, I told y'all last week, is that you don't have to worry about having enough for yourself. If you're living in overflow, there's always enough for you. It's pouring out. There has to be more than enough. And he'll make sure of that. You don't have to hoard his presence like he takes it away from you to give it to somebody else. That's not how this relationship works. He's got plenty to give. And so you need to know who you are in Christ, and you need to know the people around you by the Spirit. It's just, welcome to Christianity. This is how we are to live. I need to know who I am. I need to know the promises of God that were made to me. I need to know what he says about me. I need to know what is true about me, and I need to understand what I'm called to do. If I can say who I am and what I'm called to be, then when somebody tells me something that isn't the truth, I, can, I won't necessarily have to yell at them either. I'll just maybe bobble my head and then wait till they're gone and say, God, that ain't the truth. I know who I am. I've been here for 31 years. I've been told to quit many times. I've been told to leave many times. I've been told that it wouldn't be here. I was going on a mission trip and somebody told me that church won't even be there when you get back from your mission trip. That's not the truth. I'm called to be here. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what he says. I don't need to get in the argument with you, but I know what he says and that's not it. I'm called to be here. So if I'm called to be here, then I'm called to do what he called me to do. And for years and years, you know, the entirety of what I thought I was called to do was just serve the house. And I loved it. And if that meant, if that was the fullness of me pouring out my life, so be it. I thought, you know, I never thought that I would be up here talking to you. So I thought the best that I could get was if I could sow into the kingdom by making sure that whoever was up here didn't have to worry about all the details. I thought I can do that and sow into the ministry that way. And it's not my words, but it's just my action that'll help. 
there's fulfillment in your call doing what he says for you to do. And if he calls you to be in children's church, you're not, when you're over there faithfully serving, you're not missing his presence in here because he will meet you there. Do you understand how the call works? If you are needing healing, but you're called to be faithful over there, he will heal you there because your healing is in your call. Your strength, your grace, your favor is in your call. Being where you're supposed to be in his power and his authority. See what I mean? When you know who you're called to be, it's, it's protective, it's armor against the world. I know where I'm at. I know that I'm supposed to be there. You know, you're called to a church. When you know you're called to a church and somebody comes and tells you, hey, we should go over to this other church, you go, mm, you know, bless them, but that's not the church I'm called to. I'm called to this church. But it's amazing over there. Yeah, I imagine it is, but it, I'm not called there. I need to be faithful where I'm called. Because the people around me are going to need me to be faithful where I'm called because we lift each other up. A body is built. It's living stones, living epistles. You know, you're like, you're the, the thing that makes the body. It's not this building. The building's great, yet we are grateful to have it, especially when it rains like it did this morning. But if you're not here, it's not a church. And you need to be where you're called. So you need to know who you are but you also need to be able to discern the people around you by the Spirit. Because when you walk in, you could be bouncing along and not thinking about that at all and carelessly knock down somebody who's barely standing. Not because you're being mean, but because you didn't know how much they needed you to help them, to hold them up, to give them a word of kindness, to speak the word of God to them at the moment they needed to hear it. You can't judge, you can't judge how important the moments of your life are except by the Holy Spirit. Because you may think that you're having the worst day of your life, but that may be an attempt to keep you silent at the right moment so that somebody doesn't get what they need. And so I can't rely on how I feel because how I feel is the least important thing on the list. It's who he says I am and the power that he's given me to live. And in that power, that power by the Holy Spirit, I've been empowered to be a witness. So I can say that thing that they need to hear at the right time. Sometimes that's simple. Sometimes that's just the name of Jesus. I had that yesterday where two different people came up to me and said, Thank you for saying the name of Jesus. It's been so long since I heard anyone say it in public. I did my fifth wedding of the spring. I've never done this many weddings in my entire life. And every sing it feels like every single one of them, I learned something either about covenant or about his nature. And so this one was interesting because it's not a group of people that I'm really close to, but we're, we're close to the people who got married. And they asked me to do it for them. And I sent them the wedding that I was going to do. And they, it's always going to be about covenant and it's always going to be about Jesus. And it is being married before God is what I'm going to talk about. And they were excited for that and they wanted me to do it. So I, I did a normal wedding. And somebody runs up and they go, thank you so much for saying the name of Jesus, for praying in his name, and for talking about him during the wedding because people, people just forget how, how important he is to their relationship. And this guy was like, he's bouncing on his feet. He was so excited to tell me. And I didn't expect the name of Jesus because we hear the name of Jesus all the time. But when you say it somewhere that they don't hear it all the time, you're reminded of how powerful that name is. And that was this, 
same situation. Somebody else came over after same thing, walked up and put their arm around me and said, thank you so much for talking about Jesus this morning. I didn't, I wasn't expecting anybody. I was, you know, most times you get a pat on the shoulder, thank you, that was a beautiful service. Or that was a beautiful ceremony. But the name of Jesus had the most impact. What if I had taken that out because of the circumstances? I wouldn't, but I'm just saying, the people that needed to hear it wouldn't have heard it, and the people that needed to be encouraged wouldn't have been encouraged. It's doing what you know to do. It's, it's walking according to the truth and being faithful to it, but it's also being led in the moment. It's correctly discerning what needs to be said and the things that you've heard. A word fitly spoken in due season. You remember I preached that message to you about give me the tongue of a disciple that I would speak the word to the weary, the right word to the weary. Isaiah 49, right? Yeah. It's important. We have to stay close so we are able to. So, in 2 Timothy 1, Verse 1 and 2, and this is literally the beginning of a letter, okay? But I want you to hear how Paul begins his letter to Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Jesus Christ. What did he just say there? He said who he is, he said the authority that he has to be who he is, and he says how he's going to live. This is by the promise of Jesus. I am living by faith. I am called to be an apostle by the will of God. This is who I am. Now, what does he tell Timothy? To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. See, it's not just about knowing the truth. We need to get to the place of sensitivity in the Holy Spirit where you can discern the value of the people that you're talking to. And I'm not talking about dollar value. I'm talking about how much God loves them in this moment and desires to minister to them and how he will stop everything to minister to one person. He will change your entire day to make sure that one of his children hears a word in due season. And thank God that he's done that for me. Thank God that he's done that for you. But also this that we have received, we should freely give. We've received much. We're responsible for it. We're responsible for what we've received from God. And we're going to be diligent to to use it as he desires. So... As you're walking through life, you have this knowledge and discernment, this overflowing love, and you, you may look at someone and not see them in the natural as anyone that you need to talk to. But then God reveals to you by the, by the Spirit their kingdom potential and what they mean to Him. Do you understand that that's basically when you speak that to them, that's prophecy. It's edifying, it's encouraging, and it's comforting. It's speaking the heart of God to a person that God wants to share his heart with. It's really simple when you think of it in that context. And so you see there though, how Paul says about himself, this is who I am, and this is what I do, and this is why I do it, and this is how I do it. Because of the will of God and because of the promise of God, I can walk by faith. And I can send this letter to you in his authority. But Timothy, I see you, the beloved of God. I see you as you are. I see you loved by God. And I see you as my son. And I see what you need to hear right now. So 
grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. From God to you, with me as the messenger, by his overflowing love and the power of the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? See how it works? But, it, but overflowing love can't be self-centered. It just doesn't work. That's not overflow. That's damned up and stuck in you. And you're, you're just withholding his love from the people who need to hear it. And so it's not a self-centered thing that we get into. It's not self-conscious or self-absorbed, but God conscious, God conscious and aware of his presence. And it's also mission conscious because we know what Jesus has commanded us to do, to make disciples, to preach his word, to tell the good news to the people we come around. So as we go through this life, I was asking him, like, I see this in Paul, and I see it in what he told to Timothy, and I see the impact of Paul's words in Timothy's life. You can see that Timothy needed to hear what Paul told him, and it worked because it was the Word of God to him. And in those seeds that Paul planted by action and in word bore much fruit in Timothy's life and in Timothy's ministry, right? But there's, there's something about this overflowing love, and that's what I was thinking about this morning. See, Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Especially right in here, you know, this is your brothers and sisters. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. But the literal understanding of that verse is to love one another deeply as brothers and sisters and to take the lead in honoring one another. One translation literally says to outdo each other in honor. Why does it say that? It's the same context that I just told you. Because love can't be self-centered, it doesn't work that way. So that overflowing love will overflow in how you treat people around you. And you have to be free of offense and free of unforgiveness to be able to honor the people around you. Because a lot of things get in the way of honor sometimes. It's what people have said. It's what people have done in the past. Sometimes the people that need honor aren't receiving it because somebody dishonored you 20 years ago. And you're never going to let anybody else treat you that way again. That's not hurting anybody but you. Unforgiveness is that way. And so... I'm not waiting to receive honor before I give it. That's not how sowing and reaping works. I love how he put the whole service together. You know, if you're sowing in righteousness, that means literally that you're sowing according to the will of God, because what is righteousness but doing it his way? And you're reaping in mercy, which means that you're in his pleasure as you're reaping the things that you sowed according to his will. You're in his mercy, his, his grace that covers you. He, he delights in showing mercy. He wants to do this. But so when we honor somebody, when we take the lead in honoring them, it makes the rest of this work that we're supposed to love one another and be bound together in love. Love is the perfect bond of unity. But honor protects love. Because what it does is it says, instead of saying, he didn't speak to me, I bet he doesn't like me. It's, I should go speak to him. See what I mean, the difference? It's real simple, but... How many times 
I know people who have left churches because, you know, I went to that church for years and somebody walked by me one Sunday morning and you left? Yeah. They walked by you without talking to you one Sunday morning after 20 years and you left the church? Yes. Did you ever find out what was going on with them that day? No, it's unforgivable. (laughs) I'm sorry to laugh, I know it's happened. But do you see how messed up we can get in our heads if we are self-centered about this stuff? Like we internalize all of this and we got it all living in our heads. We're, we got dialogue living in our heads that was never said by the other person. We're writing the whole story that their life is doing to us. I've told you the story before, but I had a friend that he's a minister and he, he was wronged at church. And it was the church he attended, not one he was ministering in. And he took it before God every day in prayer. He was praying for justice and he was praying for the wrong to be righted. And about seven days in, God said, you know what? They haven't mentioned you once. And he went, oh no, this entire thing is in my head. See what I mean? See how easy, but the devil will try to cast about to divide. And so what honor does is if I'm living in a place of overflow and I'm desiring to lead the way in honor, then I'm not worried about receiving it before I give it. See, that's the life of a sower. Sowing and reaping, he gives seed to the sower. If you sow in honor, guess what? You're gonna have plenty of seeds of honor to sow. This is how God works. But if I sow in this place and I get to this place where I'm not desiring it for myself, I just wanna make sure that you get what you deserve. I want you to get the honor that you need to receive from God, whatever it is that he wants to give you. The well done, good and faithful servant that he's going to tell you at the end, but sometimes you need to hear it now to keep going. Some of you have been serving in this church for years and years. Thank you. We love you. We couldn't do it without you. Literally couldn't do it without you. Thank you for being faithful to God. Thank you for being faithful to God in every aspect. You know, I mean, the lights again got knocked out by a storm this morning, but they came back on during prayer before church started. But thank God we have lights because there's people who sow. There's people who believe in sowing and reaping, tithing, giving. You honor faithfulness, but you also honor the fact that if God desires to honor somebody, you might not know why he wants to honor them. You may have never seen what it was about them. And God says, you're about to, some of you are about to go to lunch somewhere and he may tell you, buy them dinner because I want to. But God, I don't know them. I know them. There was one man while we were in Africa, Ron, that I walked up to and God told me, if you knew who this man was to me, you would ask him to pray for you. He said, his prayers have changed nations because he has been faithful for years. Nobody knows his name. God knows his name. That's why we have to be really sensitive to the spirit as we walk in this life because you don't know you need to be able to discern by the spirit the value that you're walking around how important they are to God and how important they are to the kingdom and how important your word fitly spoken in due season is to them and how much their word is going to mean to you when you need it the attitude of showing honor to those around you will help keep your heart right because it keeps you focused outside instead of internalizing all of these things that we go through on a daily basis. One of the things they asked me to add, they wanted, I normally 
talk to the people about the wedding before I do the wedding, and they specifically ask for 1 Corinthians 13 to be in there, and I didn't tell you, Adela, because I didn't know I was going to say it, but they wanted love is patient, love is kind, love never takes into account a wrong suffered. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. I'm getting it out of order. It endures much, and it never fails. And that over, overflowing love in our lives, that's how it's going to be. You're not going to be able to take into account a wrong suffered and walk around with it for the rest of your life and be effective in ministry. That will cut the flow in your life like that. You have to guard your heart. Honor helps you guard your heart because you're keeping these things outside. You are looking to show honor instead of waiting to see if you receive it and grading accordingly, judging people by how they treat you. How about you and God work out your salvation based on how you treat them? Because he said some really scary things about, I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink and I was in prison and you visited me. And if you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Uh Uh-oh. That means I can't know anybody by the flesh. I can't judge them for their station. I can't judge them for the corner they're standing on. I don't know how they got there. Only what God says do and not do. What he says say and not say. Pray and not pray. If I pray in agreement according to the word of God, it's going to come to pass. What if we just discerned what he wanted to pray on a daily basis? That's why praying in the spirit is so important because if you don't know how to pray, he'll pray through you. You can come into agreement with it by the spirit. He'll pray his will. Sometimes you'll be praying in the spirit, you'll see somebody's face and you'll be praying in the spirit. All of a sudden, English is coming out of your mouth. It's the opposite of what you think it is. Like sometimes you're you're just praying and the Holy Spirit prays through you and in your prayer language, and then other times you're praying in your prayer language and English starts coming out and it's the declaration of the Lord over their life. They don't even know, but you're lifting them up. You know, that's still showing honor. That's showing honor with your time because you're allowing God to use it the way he wants to use it. Just like today, we allowed, we showed God honor by allowing him to conduct this service in the manner that he desired without demanding that it go according to our plan. That's important. Who does he want to minister to and how does he want to minister to them? It's so cool, Ron, because I don't have to talk about if you bring your gift to the altar and you know that your brother has ought against you because you already took care of that. But I had the scripture in my notes because I was gonna say, you notice that that doesn't say, wait for your brother to get over it. Because that's not honor. That's not as far as it be unto me to be at peace with everyone around me. The whole ministry is reconciliation. If we can't play nice together, then we're not gonna do anything in the world. If we can't love one another, how are we going to love everybody else? Part of overflow is making sure that there's nothing hindering the flow. And, you know, I think that's a very important thing. That's what we were kind of talking about over the last couple of days, Mary, is if you notice that there's somebody you have trouble honoring, that needs to be raked out. I'll tell you something funny that I saw in when Jesus told Peter that the devil asked to sift him like wheat. I see that like a litter box. For those of you who own cats, like the devil wants what's his. <laughs> He's sifting it out of the litter box. Well, there's some of these things that we find when we, we are 
we start praying for this ability to love the way God loves and to honor the way God honors and to show it the way he wants to show it. And we realize that there's a place where the flow doesn't happen, where there's this, and sometimes it's circumstantial. It's like a situation that you live through that makes everything bubble back up. And there's places that need healing. And we're still in a season of deep healing. There are things that he's handling now, even though we're moving quickly into new ministry and new opportunities, but there's, there's some things that he's still healing in us. But if you see something that is inhibiting the flow of God, do what Ron said. It doesn't have to be complicated. Give it to him. Honor protects your heart. Love covers. You know, crucify him becomes forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. When you're living in this way. Bow your heads and close your eyes. feel the Lord is ministering to us right now in this. I saw something during it and it was the like Mary at his feet honoring Jesus' presence. That that's what we've been doing today. He didn't want us to to do some of the things that we, he might have asked us to do on a normal Sunday. He wanted it to be different today for a reason. And I acknowledge your presence in this place, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome to reveal to us anything that is hindering the flow, Lord, anything that is constricting the flow of your love and the flow of your ministry through us, Holy Spirit, anything that is keeping us from revealing the nature of God or revealing his heart. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, if he shows you somebody's face or he reminds you of a circumstance, now's the time. And we give it to him. We don't hold on to it. We don't hold them accountable. I give them to God. God can work out what needs to happen. He can work out the, the right way to handle that. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm not carrying it around anymore. I'm free. And so if you see something in you that needs to go, surrender it. You say, Lord, I give it to you now. I ask for your grace to help me leave it alone and not pick it back up. God, I don't want to walk around with this anymore. That's a part of the old life. And I, your blood covers that. And I allow it now in Jesus' name to stay covered in your blood. Forgive me, God, for holding on to it too long, for, for not giving it to you. But now that I have revelation, God, I am not going to walk one more day with it. I give it to you now wholeheartedly, Jesus. Wash me clean. Some of you need to know him for the first time. Some of you need to return to Jesus. It's right now. It doesn't need to be complicated. You tell him. Tell him, Jesus, I need you. I believe that you died for me on the cross. And I believe that you rose again. Ask him to forgive him, you of all of your sins. To wash you clean by his blood. To give you the grace to live his way. 